just as Daniel and his friends were tempted and as culture was trying to shape their identity, they stayed faithful to God's word and they stayed faithful to God's church. And so similar to Daniel, we as young people and older ones, culture tries to shape us in so many ways. And it is important that we determine in our hearts to stay faithful to God's word and to God's church, because that is the only steady ground, and all other ground is sinking sand. And so as we uh, close this session, we want to thank Pastor Mark Finley. Uh, we wish he was able to be in person, uh, but we're at least thankful that he was able to speak to us. And it is our prayer that you are blessed by it. Let's pray as we close this session. A loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, and we ask you that in this impure, corrupt age, that we can live a life of faithfulness to you, to your message, and to your mission. And we ask you, dear God, that you will pour out your spirit upon us. And just as Daniel and his friends determined in their hearts to stay faithful to you, that we will determine within our hearts to stay faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. As we saw in our schedule, uh, tomorrow we have uh, seminars. We have five breakout seminars with four sessions for each seminars, and it will all be happening in this building, but in various rooms. And as the speakers, sem our speaker, seminar speakers come, so come up, I want you to look at your seminar schedule, and you also have the speaker bio and seminar information here. And so I'm going to ask each one of our seminar speakers to introduce their seminar and what they will be talking about. And I'll start with uh, Mr. Chad. All right, good evening. Well, my name is Chad Cruiser. I'm going to be presenting a seminar on four battles to fight and win through the power of Jesus. We're going to be looking at a number of different things that people are struggling with, specifically young people today. We're going to be looking at doubt versus faith, skepticism, which is so prominent in, in society and is growing to a catastrophic level today. We're going to look at that. We're also going to look at sexuality, looking at the issues that people are dealing with today, homosexuality, transgenderism, pornography. We're going to look at the research on these various issues. And number, we're also going to go on, we're going to look at depression, one of the issues that people are struggling with. And there's one more. What is it? I, I should know off the top of my head. Uh, let's see it here. I think I got it. Uh, oh, yeah, media addiction. That's actually the first one. We're going to be looking at media. Uh, how does that impact us? What does it do to our brain? So those are going to be the four subjects. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Shin, and I'll be doing a seminar on how to study the Bible, specifically in your personal devotions. And I hope that it'll be a practical one for you. We'll be looking at particular passages, bring a pen and paper, and we'll be looking at diagramming and so forth, and the four steps in interpretation, observation, interpretation, imagination, and application. So I hope that this is very practical for you. Have you ever opened a, uh, up your scriptures or your Bible and uh, looked at a passage and you're like, how do you even break this thing down? And I hope that this can be a blessing to you in your personal walk in relationship with Christ and also in developing material for worship talks and sermons as well. So that's going to be my seminar tomorrow and the next day. Good evening, everyone. My name is Randy Skeet. I will be conducting a seminar on the subject of God's calling for your life. And I'll break it up into various sections, of course. One has to do with the concept of purpose as a fundamental principle of the government of God. Purpose. Then we look at ability which God gives to every single person that he or she might execute that purpose. We'll also look at how to determine what skills or avenues have God provided for you and me to determine what that purpose is. And so that's what I will be dealing with in my seminars. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Holland. I'll be doing a seminar called Love Connection, 
separating facts from fiction in relationships, dating, and marriage. And so what we'll be doing is we will be outlining a biblical framework for what is marriage and then talk about how, to you, how do you then uh, utilize tools that are necessary to have healthy relationships that might eventually lead one day to marriage. And while there are some that are kind of being bashful, I would expect to see you in the seminar tomorrow. I think I know where all the singles are going tomorrow. I'm representing Dr. Subodh Pandit. He couldn't be here this evening. So here's a short excerpt that uh, he wanted me to read on behalf of him. How would you converse with a person who does not believe that God exists or that the Bible is re reliable or that Jesus ever lived on earth? He says that he does not want to be a blind believer and values only science, reason, and logic not unsubstantiated, blameless claims. What will be the contents of your conversation with such a person? Come search with me. It's a seminar that orients you to respond in a reasonable, informed, and intelligent manner. Two basic principles apply. First, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Always be ready to defend the reason for your beliefs before anyone. Number two, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20 to 22. Put yourself in the shoes of the other person and use what is valuable to him. Science, reason, and philosophy. Not religious jargon, which is unfamiliar and probably meaningless to him. This seminar orients you to the correct attitude and equips you with the necessary and credible scientific, logical, and philosophical information that stands the scrutiny an examination of the rational thinker out in the secular and non-Christian world. Some of the questions addressed, does God really exist? Are all religions basically the same? On what grounds would an earnest inquirer choose Christianity? It will provide you confidence and strengthen your faith. In quietness and in confidence shall your strength be. Isaiah 30:15. The most common response has been, you really made me think. So put on your thinking caps and come search with me. Each session will include a Q&A period. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Park. I am not sharing a seminar, but I will be sharing my testimony. Thank you so much, and you may be seated. And as you... Um, as you have seen, you know, some, some of you may wonder, you know, I want to attend all of the seminars, but I'm, I'm not gifted with omnipresence. What do I do? <laughs> you know, we, do, we will be recording all of the audios, and it will be later posted on Audioverse, where you can listen to all of the seminars uh, later at a time. And we will, also, uh, we will also let you know tomorrow where each of the seminars are going, going to be. Barely, oops, sorry. I was barely a teenager when I had the privilege to attend a youth convention uh, such as this one uh, this evening. And the speaker was from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And what impressed me and my friends was that when he preached, he quoted the Bible texts and the Spirit of Prophecy quotes from his memory. And we were quite impressed. Uh, with that. But also deeply etched in my memory is a sermon that he preached called Not So. Not So. And it's been almost 14 years. It was in 2009 when I met him. And you will see on the screen, yes, that was Pastor Randy Skeet, and yes, that was me. And ever since that year, 2009, I've emailed him several times through the years and have requested him for counsel. And he's been very gracious and very kind in responding to each of those emails. And so this evening, I'm glad that he's going to be our speaker, one of our main speakers. And 
He's a graduate of Oakwood Adventist University and also the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. But most importantly, we are glad that he's here because he's a servant of God and he loves young people. We will hear from Pastor Randy Skeet, before which we will first listen to a special music and then Elijah Martin will read scripture and offer the prayer. Our scripture reading for today will be uh, from Genesis 15, 1 through 6. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord, God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born is my house, is my heir. One born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Before we have our sermon tonight, I'd like, I'd like you to invite, I'd like you to, <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we have been waiting all week for your Sabbath and it has arrived. Thank you that the Sabbath is a day of rest and we can worship you. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and purify our hearts through your word. Bless our speaker tonight. Bless him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. And thank you for this great weekend we're having. And when we leave, please help us to be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. With the word of God in his hands, every human being, wherever his lot in life may be cast, may have such companionship as he shall choose. In its pages, he may hold converse with the noblest and best of the human race, and may listen to the voice of the Eternal as he speaks with men, as he studies and meditates upon the themes into which the angels desire to look he may have their companionship. He may follow the steps of the heavenly teacher and listen to his words as when he taught on mountain and plain and sea. He may dwell in this world in the atmosphere of heaven, imparting to earth's sorrowing, tempted ones, thoughts of hope and longings for holiness, himself coming closer and still closer into fellowship with the unseen, like him of old who walked with God, coming nearer and nearer the threshold of the eternal world until the portal shall open and he shall enter there. He will find himself no stranger. The voices that will greet him are the voices of the holy ones, voices who on earth were unseen his companions, voices that here he learned to distinguish and to love. He who through the word of God has lived in fellowship with heaven, will find himself at home 
in heaven's companionship. Education, page 127, paragraph 1. God is good? That's weak. God is good? Still weak. God is good? And all the time. Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. I am highly honored, I really am, to be with you, and I'm grateful to my young brother, Brother John, for extending the invitation to me. I'm honored on two levels. One, it is always a privilege to speak for God, and two, it's a privilege to be associated with the Young People's Program, even though I'm not a young person. And so I am doubly delighted to be here. Before I go any further, who is present who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand. Anyone? No one? Or are you shy? If you know someone who won't raise his or her hand, just do that. And that ought to bring the person to the surface. Nobody. We're all Seventh-day Adventists. All right. Well, if some non-Seventh-day Adventist listens to this recorded version, wherever you are, may the Lord bless you as superabundantly as I believe. He will bless us in this place. I have many, many extra minutes, but that's not a threat. I will not use them. I just wanted you to know if you see me ending early, it's not because I'm in a hurry to leave. It's because I have said what God sent me to say, and when I've finished that, I tend to sit down. What states are you from? Can you tell me where you're from? Alabama? Ohio. Ohio. Oh, you're my neighbor. I'm from Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Who is from Ohio? Where are the Buckeyes? You and I are not supposed to get along. I hope you know that. Okay. But we'll make an exemption during this meeting. <laughs> Any other state? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Very historic state. God bless Pennsylvania, named after an Englishman. All right. Any other state? Yeah, well, God bless Michigan. That's where uh, the very first conference in the history of the Adventist Church was Michigan. And Michigan was organized in 1860 before the General Conference was organized, May 21, 1863. So we're very jealous of that bit of historical uniqueness. Any other state? West, where is that? Is that the United States? Okay. West Virginia. God bless West Virginia. Uh, <laughs> God will save a lot of people in West Virginia. Okay. Any other state? What? Mar oh, yes. Home state. Yes, we can. Charity begins at home. All right. I was in Maryland. Well, it's not a home state. This is Virginia. Last week, actually, a little town called Chestertown. Had a lovely time. This is now Virginia. Did I hear some state on this side? Dakota. Which one? North Dakota. Do you live there in this winter as well? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I've never been to North Dakota. My wife and I have talked about going there in the summer <laughs> to, see, <laughs> to see the Badlands. I don't know if it's north or south. Uh, Mount Rushmore. Lovely place when the sun is shining and there's no snow. Any other state? Did I miss a state? What? Did I miss a state? What countries are represented? Tell me. Johannesburg is, is a state in the United States. I didn't know that. I must go back to school and study my geography more intensively. I've been to South Africa, oh, 15 times or so. I love that country. I tell my friends in South Africa, I'm raising funds on GoFundMe to buy South Africa. I love the country. I've been there about 15 times. I really have. It's a lovely country. Any other country represented? India. India. I've been there twice, I think. Twice? Yes. God bless India. Ghana, I've been there about seven times. God bless Ghana, I've been there twice. God bless Malawi, a long way, Blantyre, and a, place, a little place called Zomba. Uh, where's the Malawian? Zom oh, okay. Any other country? Where? Where? Colombia. Oh, God, I have a very good friend whose wife is from Colombia. Pakistan, I've never been there. But I've heard of Wasim Akram. Okay. Uh, any, any other country? Yes. Pakistan. Pakistan, yes. God bless Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Any other country? Bolivia. Bolivia. 
Up in the mountains. God bless Bolivia. Where is Lake Titicaca? Or oh, Peru? Okay, all right. I don't want to cause a, a, a war between countries. Any other country? El Salvador, Central America. I came close, but didn't get there. I was in uh, Belize a couple of years ago. Any other country? Where's that? Argentina. When I was in a Chestertown last week, I was in the gym working out, and there was a young man next to me. I said, where are you from? He said, Argentina. Lovely country, the land of Messi and Maradona. Okay, <laughs> any other country? <laughs> Mexico. I've been there once. I was in Tijuana. And uh, God bless Mexico. We have a good medical school there at Montimo Montemorelos. Yes. Okay. Yes. Did I hear? Trinidad and Tobago. I've been there once. Have very good friends from Trinidad and Tobago. God bless that two island nation. Any Iraq? Well, that's an ancient country. You heard about Mark Finley re reading from Daniel 1. That's that area of the world. Okay, Iraq. God bless Iraq. Estonia. Not a very big country, but God has people in Estonia. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. God bless Estonia. Any other country? Dominican Republic. God bless the Dominican Republic, the land of Sammy Sosa. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, my sister. Who? Chile. All right, I've never been to Chile. God bless Chile. Mm -hmm. Did you raise your hand? Guatemala. Guatemala. Well, I was close to Guatemala as well, being in, uh, in Belize, that Central American strip. Have we exhausted all the countries? What about the United States? Anyone from the United States? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was about to panic quietly. Uh, what? Did I hear another name? Panama? You're from Panama. All right, Panama. I've never been there, but... I'm originally from Barbados, and a lot of Barbadians towards the, uh, the early part of the 20th century traveled to Panama, you can guess why, to build the uh, Panama Canal. So there are probably a few skeets in Panama because that's generally a Barbadian name. All right, so much for the introductory pleasantries. Let's get to the message, which is explaining the impossible. What did I say? Explain. Explaining the impossible. Before I begin, do three little favors for me. They're not difficult. Well, one of them is, which is turn off your phone. Enormously difficult. Let me turn mine off. If you're not using this gadget as a Bible, which it isn't, make sure it's turned completely off. If you're using it, make sure it's turned down. Favor, and that's in the interest of reverence. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I want you to reflect briefly on that statement. God said, I have put my words in thy mouth. We have the divine and we have the earthly. We have the pure and we have dirt. I have put my words in thy mouth. I want to speak God's words. I also like 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And so I want the word of God in my mouth and in my tongue. And favor number three, think. There's so many young college students. Think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for life. With all our challenges and difficulties and aches and pains, we're grateful to be alive. And we thank you for that. We ask you today, God, immediately, if we've sinned against you, forgive us, Father. Christ died that we might be forgiven. We ask you for grace. We ask you for mercy. We ask you today, God, for a generous outpouring of your Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth. Let him guide my thinking and my speaking, and let him enlighten the minds of those who are listening. Father, put your ideas in my mind, your words in my mouth, and the humility of Christ in my heart. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl. And for those who will listen to the recorded version, Father, bless them, I pray, please. Now, dear God, bless this country of the United States. 
Guide the leaders in all the deliberations, their father. Remind them somehow that righteousness exalteth a nation. And bless all the nations that were mentioned, represented by those seated in your presence. Place your hand of healing on the sick, dear God. Save us when you come. Until then, keep us faithful, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. I very much like, according to thy words, Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man purify his life or get it purified? How can a young man or a young woman conquer one bad habit or another? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, which means it is possible for a young person or an older person to have his or her life cleaned up. If you agree, say amen. The Bible says, wherewithal, how? Because some things look impossible. Some addictions are so strong, conquest over these things seems almost impossible. But the Bible says very simply, how can a young man or a young woman cleanse his way or her way? And the answer is simple, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Clearly then, the word must have divine power. Because only divine power can conquer sin. Let me say that again differently. Only someone equal with the Father could have given his life for the sinner. Only divine power can conquer sin. The most powerful being in the universe after God is Satan. Eloi said when he left heaven, he took all his power with him. He just lost his position. Even Gabriel needed help from Christ, Daniel 10, 12 and 13, to deal with Satan who had blocked him when he brought the answer to Daniel. And Gabriel told Daniel they heard him the very first day he spoke. But for three weeks, he was held up by the interference of this being called Satan. And so, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. When Jesus spoke to the disciples in John 15, he told them in verse 3, Now you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ye are clean, ye are purged. Now, there's only one thing that God purges us of, and that is sin. According to thy word, in the spirit of according to thy word, let us go to Luke chapter 1. Luke was a medical doctor. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. Luke wrote two books of the New Testament. What are those two books? Luke and Acts, yes. And those two books combined make up approximately one quarter of the New Testament writings. Luke chapter 1, we read from verse 26. It's 741. I'll release you as soon as I can. Do you have Luke 1? You can answer me when I ask you a question. Do you have Luke 1? Yes. Reading from verse 26. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. If you have that version, you may feel free to read with me. And in the second month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was, you tell me, Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she heard him, she was troubled at his saying. Or when she saw him, he was troubled, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, you tell me, Jesus. He shall be great. And shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary is listening to all of this. Let's put ourselves in Mary's position. 
The angel tells her she will have a son who will be a king. And Mary is quite aware that Palestine or the Israelite nation have been under Roman subjugation for decades. She knows that when the three major feasts are held, everyone comes to Jerusalem and the Roman army comes as well to keep order because that's usually when uh, these riots would break out. She knew that the, the, the procurator lived in Caesarea and he had uh, administrative authority over the area where she lived. She knew that. She most likely knew there was a Caesar or the emperor over in Rome who had all around power over the empire. She knew all of that, yet the angel tells her, you will have a son. He shall sit on the throne of his father David, and there shall be no end to his kingdom. And for her, I imagine, it seemed as if there would be no end to Roman domination. Now, how is this young lady to believe this? What's her subject? Explaining the impossible. Now read verse 4. Now, she's also <clears throat> unattached. She has no boyfriend. She has no husband. Yes, she's to have a child. You can understand verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Let me pause <clears throat> and let you dwell on that regardless of your age. How can this be? Seeing I know not a man. How can I be drunk when I don't? Come on, drink. No, how can I, how can this or that happen when this, the behavior that contributes to that is not part of my lifestyle? This was not the day of in vitro fertilization. Back then, there weren't sperm banks. How am I to have a child, says Mary, a very, very legitimate question. And the angel answered and said unto her, verse 35, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Let's look at 35 again. The Holy Ghost shall do what is physiologically impossible. I cannot have a child. I cannot be expectant. I cannot be pregnant. I don't have a boyfriend. I don't have a husband. I'm not a prostitute. I don't sleep with men. How is this possible? The Holy Spirit will make possible what in your estimation is impossible. What's our subject? explaining the impossible. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Let me ask a question, incidental question. The Holy Spirit and the power of the highest, are those two different kinds of power? Same thing. Same thing. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived her son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now we have another impossibility made possible. Elizabeth was barren. What does barren mean? Unable to have a child. By the way, it's very interesting. God is sometimes called the God of... The God of three men. The God of? Come on. The God of? Abraham? Isaac? Mm -hmm. You ought to repent for being so slow. <laughs> He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our spiritual fathers. Who was Abraham's wife? She was barren. Who was Isaac's wife? She was barren. Who was uh, Jacob's wife? Come on, don't slow down. This is not with the search. Who was Jacob's wife? She was barren. We are spiritually descended from forebears who had to live with the impossible made possible. Are you not listening? I'm talking to myself. We are descendants 
of our forebears, our ancestors who lived with the reality of God making the impossible, finish my words, possible. Now, the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. Why did I say that? If he did it, uh-huh, come on, you do it now. He did it for Sarah. She was one person. I want you to pretend no one else is in this audience but you, listening to me. He did it for Sarah. Read my mind, what am I about to say? He'll do it for you. Forget your family, your classmates, the conference, the union, the division, the GC, and the Milky Way. He did it for Sarah. Come on, finish my words. He'll do it for you. He did it for Rebecca. No, change you now. He'll do it for me. Mm -hmm. And so the angel told Mary, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, who was called barren. For with God, verse 37, nothing shall be impossible. But for many of us, a lot of things in our lives seem to be impossible. I can't conquer that sin. I can't conquer that weakness. I can't forgive that man. I can't forgive that woman. I cannot, uh, whatever it may be. There are impossibilities in our lives, and I place that word impossibilities in quotation marks because a so-called Christian cannot worship a God who can do anything and still say there are impossibilities in my life. Verse 37, but let me pray again. Father in heaven, as I continue, please God, restrain me and remind me I'm in this pulpit for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> if you have the King James Version, read with me. <clears throat> and Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me. Did I tell you read with me? <laughs> Behold the handmaid of the Lord. King James Version. Be it unto me. According to thy word. Now, we need to concentrate on that statement. What does she mean by, be it unto me? Be what unto me? The pregnancy. I'm single. No male intimates. Yet you said, I'll have a child. Let this impossible thing happen how? According to thy word. You were living, as I said earlier, in the Milky Way. How was the Milky Way made? <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God said. Now, if God's word can create a universe, can God's word make a young woman pregnant? Yes or no? Yes. If God's word can bring life. And God said, Genesis 1, let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind. The living creature. Consequently, the word of God, to create a living creature, the word of God must be living. God bless whoever said that. Bright man. Mm. This is life. Genesis, uh, not Genesis, John chapter 1, verse 1. You know it very well. Say it with me. In the beginning was the? And the word was with? And the word was God. Go to verse 4. In him was? And the life was the light of men. In him was life. And he is the word. The word of God has life and is life. Let's drop the has life. The word of God is life. If I were to say the word of God has life, you may say in which book? But when I say the Word of God is life, we're talking about Genesis to Revelation. How many of you can recite the 66 books in order? Can I? We have one uncertain hand right over here. One and a half hands. Is that hand going up? We have two. 
Oh, oh, okay, all right. The strong advocates are on that side. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> the Word of God is life. What did Jesus say in John 6, 63? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. What does quickeneth mean? Christ will judge the quick and the dead. What does quick mean? Living. It is the Word, the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are, and they are. Mm -hmm. And so Mary said, be it unto me, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Let's look at that. What do you understand by behold the handmaid? Did Sarah have a handmaid, yes or no? What was her name? What was her function? To serve Sarah. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary says, behold the handmaid of the Lord. What is she saying? I'm your servant. Now, finish the verse. Be it unto me. Come on. According to that. Listen to your elder brother. This should be what you say under all circumstances. You have a desire for a romantic relationship, nothing wrong with that. What do you ought to say? Be it unto me, come on, according to thy word, not according to a MTV or uh, you name the shows. Not according to the shows on television. Not according to friends if you lived in the 90s. According to thy word. I'm not joking. Now, if you pursue it according to thy word, you look odd. And no one wants to look odd. Regardless of age. That's why many young people will not let it be known in college that they're Adventists. For fear of provoking the ridicule of their friends. And so they hide the fact that they have a God. Be it unto me according to thy word. You want to go pursue one profession or the other according to thy word. It must always be according to thy word because the word has the power to make the impossible possible in that path. Whether it's romantic, it's professional, it's educational, it's family, it, whatever it is, the word has the power to make the impossible possible in your lives because at some point in our lives, we will encounter something we view as impossible. Be it unto me. But first she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. This is surrender. You see, in the Old Testament, the word for belief means to support. You look at a, a concordance, you'll see support. You see confirm before you see other suggested meanings. Support. In other words, Mary virtually saying, I support you in what you just said. Even though I don't understand, come on, how? I support you. I am with you. Faith, belief. In the light of explaining the impossible, let's go to our scripture reading. What was it? Not Luke. Genesis what? 15, 1 to 6. Do you have that? Is it your culture not to answer the preacher? <laughs> well, I don't want to disobey your culture, but it feels very good when I ask you a question and you answer me. I don't feel so alone and isolated and distant. What book did I say? Yeah. What chapter? Yeah. Reading for what verse? Yeah. Let's pray again. Fathers, I continue. You tighten your grip on me even more, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. We're looking at another impossibility. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. In chapter 14, Abraham rescued Lot from captivity. He had been captured by four invading nations from the other side of the Euphrates River. Abraham armed his servants under the direction of God, chased those four armies, defeated them, brought back Lot. And the ruler of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. 
That's in chapter 14. And in verse 22, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. So Abraham refused to take anything. He gave all the, the loot, as you may call it, to the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he ended up with nothing, even though he won the battle. Now, you can understand verse 1 of chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, read with me now, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Let me digress briefly. Sometimes as a child of God, you have to lose to move forward. Let me take out the word lose. You have to give up a right, never a principle. You may have to give up your right in order to continue the work of God. You never give up a principle. Abraham had the right to keep all that loot. He gave it up so that the king of Sodom would not say he had contributed to Abraham. Abraham wanted God alone. He wanted God's name kept clear. And so he gave up. In the previous chapter 13, in the conflict between him and Lot, he had the right to choose first. He gave it up to Lot. Many times, conflicts persist because someone will not give up a right. That has nothing to do with eternal life. And we stick to our rights in violation of principle. As I often say, everything that's right is not necessarily righteous. And so God tells Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Elias of Damascus. And Abram said, verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, not Eliezer, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Verse 5, And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. The angel told Mary, Your son will be a king. The word of the Lord tells Abraham, Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. Now, the word of the Lord knew what is written in Genesis 11, verse 30. Go there quickly with me. Genesis 11, verse 30, it is 8 o'clock on the dot. The time I should have begun originally. So your time of liberation is not far off. <laughs> what book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? 11, what verse? 30. Now, you read that verse. Now, Sarai was barren. Come on. She had Abraham, as I said earlier, was married to a woman incapable of conceiving. Now, keep this in mind. Listen to the angel now in Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. The word tell means to count. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. The angel virtually told Mary, you're single, you have no boyfriend, no husband, you don't sleep around, you're not a lady of the night, you'll have a child. It's like a professor telling you, you don't study, you have no textbook, you don't come to class, you don't do the labs, you'll pass. <laughs> you must ask, how? So Abraham hears this. He knows his wife is barren. But read verse 6. As you read 6, keep 38 of Luke 1 in mind. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Read verse 6 now. And he, come on, believed in the Lord. Keep reading. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Same thing happened to Mary, even though it's not explicitly stated. Because righteousness is counted to the person who believes in Christ. I got one amen. 
This is highly discouraging. One amen for the statement of, about righteousness by faith, the central teaching of the Bible. One amen. I'm never coming back to this church. <laughs> he believed in the Lord. Hmm? He didn't believe in Sarah or his manly capabilities. He believed in the Lord. You will have to handle this impossibility. You know, when, Je when Jehoshaphat was told three armies were coming against him to destroy him, he called all Israel to pray. And in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, at the end of the prayer, he said, O Lord God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. Who knows how that verse ends? But our eyes, come on. By the way, if we would think like that, our problems would cease to look so massive. We look at the problem and never look at God. I need a job, that's all we look at. I have bills, that's all we look at. And we take our eye of God, who says, the silver and the gold are mine. We take our eye of God who gave the first job to the first man. Actually, the first person on earth to work was God himself. We look at the problem and don't look at God. And the Bible says, by beholding, come on. Mm. So we become more and more like the problem because that's all we look at instead of looking at God. If a father's walking his little boy, the little boy is walking ahead of the father. The little boy sees a snake. He runs straight to the father. Are you with me? And behind him. <laughs> There's danger. Father, take over. When we see danger, we look at it. And God's behind us. When we should be behind him, we look at it. There's a snake. Long fangs. <laughs> Fat body. He's a viper. He's an aspen. He's a constrictor all in one. What can I do? And God is behind us like this. And the angels are saying, Father, why doesn't he call you? He believed, come on, tell me, in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, God's righteousness functions the same way at all ages. There isn't a youthful righteousness. There isn't a youthful fornication and geriatric fornication. Am I talking to myself? There is sin. Is there hell for young people? And one for the old? Oh, there are two hells. What by? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> is there hell just for the young? No. Is there heaven just for the elderly? No. We all go, same place. The righteousness of God is his righteousness regardless of your age. And sin is sin regardless of your age. What's the penalty for sin? Tell me quickly. Yeah. At what age? Any age. The gift of God is the eternal life. For what age group? Any age group. Now, can you believe in the Lord as Abraham did? Can you say to God, behold the handmaid of the Lord, or behold the maid servant, the man servant of the Lord, be it unto me. A young lady wrote me earlier this week, my friends are telling me I'm too extreme by holding out for an Adventist boyfriend because there's some nice young men, they're not Adventists, but they're nice. What should I do? I tend to be blunt sometimes. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it saves time. <laughs> I wrote it back in capitalized. Under no circumstance, involve yourself in that. Do not even discuss it at the theoretical level. Because if Eve had not entered into discussion with the enemy, you and I might not be in this condition today. Don't even discuss it. If a friend of yours is urging you to commit sin, find another friend. Doing right makes us look strange to the world. Believing in God 
genuinely makes you look odd. But I want you to say the Lord's Prayer with me now. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, you say it now, thy will be done in earth. Come on. Stop. Is that symbolic or literal? Quickly. Literal. If there are young 17-year-old angels in heaven now, how do they obey God? Perfectly. Then how should 17-year-olds on earth obey God? Perfectly. Are there 10-year-old angels who are now getting their wings to grow? If they are, how do they obey? How did Jesus obey at 10? I realize we go through various ages and stages, child, infant, toddler, whatever the psychologist uh, say uh, pre-adolescent, adolescent, whether that's real or not, young adult, adult, then over the hill. <laughs> it does not change the grace of God. Somebody say amen. amen. According to thy word still applies. According to thy word. Explaining the impossible. In Psalm 119, go there with me as quickly as you can. Psalm 119, let's read verse 133. Then we'll go to Psalm 19 and read verse 13. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Very interesting chapter, by the way, the way it's uh, written and designed. Study that chapter sometime, you'll be richly blessed. Verse 133, let me pray again. Father, I'm close to closing. Continue to be with me, I pray. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. What does that verse say? Order my steps. Come on. In thy word, stop. In other words, Father, help me to walk how? Come on. According to thy word. Order my steps. Arrange my life how? According to thy word. What's the result? Finish the verse. Let not any iniquity, come on, have dominion over me. Take the word dominion out. Give me another word. Control? Starts with an A. Authority, but that's not the word I want, but that's a good word. D. D. I. How many clues do you need? C. Addiction. Not prediction, addiction. <laughs> addiction. Let no addiction have power. Now, question for you. Do addictions have power, yes or no? Oh, yes. That's why some people in the fifth and sixth rehabilitation program. And I'm not being funny. Because it's not funny. Do you know how many people on earth are enslaved? Either the cigarettes they have to smoke. Many years ago, I worked at the University of Michigan Medical School, and uh, in my travels on campus, I'd see people walk out of the hospital pushing whatever they're pushing, an apparatus with, with wires and to go smoke. Now, they're carrying this apparatus because they were smoking in the first place, and the lungs were destroyed, but they have to, and they're pushing this thing, can hardly walk out of the hospital because you cannot smoke in the building to smoke. Addicted to drugs, addicted to gambling, addicted to sex, addicted to food. We live in a world of addicts. And the greatest addiction, sin. Now the Bible says, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. No addiction. Go to Psalm 19. Let's read verse 13. Our subject, explaining the impossible, is 12 minutes after 8. Do you have Psalm 19? Verse 13. Do you have the King? Who has the King James Version? May I see your hands? Ah, all of you, and you never read. Okay. Are you there? Psalm 1913. Read with me now. What does that say? Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Now, carefully keep reading. Let them not have. Mm -hmm. 
That's a backup verse to Psalm 119, 133. But I want you to observe where the power to do this lies. Read verse 19 again, the first part. What does that say? Now, who does the keeping back? God. With our cooperation. God. Now, go to verse 133 of Psalm 119. Verse 133 of Psalm 119. Let's see who does what. Do you have that? Read with me. What does that say? Order my steps in thy word. Now, who is doing the ordering? God. And what's the instrument of ordering? His word. Now, finish the verse. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. You can lose that short temper. You can win victory over shopping till you drop. Then get up and drop again. There's power. Order my steps. According to your word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. My brothers and sisters, you and I live in a world made by the word of God. Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, heaven and earth, made by the word of God. Surely, the power that made you is the power that can keep you. It's a biblical principle. Because verse 7 of 2 Peter chapter 3 says, but the heavens and the earth which are now by that same word kept in store. I've said it many times. The word that creates is the word that sustains. And the word made the universe. And the word made you. And me. And based upon a biblical principle that's unbreakable, the power that creates is a power that sustains. And so Hebrews 1 verse 3 tells us, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding how many things? All things. How? By the word of his power. We have no time for this because we're busy. You give a student a final exam to prepare for and the Bible and a person won't spend five minutes on the Bible. Even though a knowledge of the Bible makes it easier to understand your academic work. Christ Object Lessons, page 125, paragraph 3. Listen carefully. If the believer will believe God's word and follow it, there is no science in the natural world he will not be able to grasp and appreciate. <laughs> because this is written by the one in whom dwelleth all wisdom and knowledge. If the believer, or if the child of God, if the servant of God, the follower, will believe his word and practice it. Give me another word for practice. It has four letters. Obey. There is no science. Name some sciences that gave you a headache. Astronomy. astronomy. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say astrology. Astronomy. Come on, physics. Everyone who studies physics develops humility. Physics. <laughs> Come on. Microbiology. Hmm? Uh, what? Chemistry. Who? Chemistry. Mm -hmm. You name all the sciences. There is no science in the natural world. He will not be able to grasp, meaning you understand it, appreciate, connected with God, the creator. If the follower of God will believe his word and practice it, then to avoid this is to deny yourself a higher level of academic excellence. What's our subject? You're too slow when I ask you that question. What's the subject? And what's the power? 
the word of God. What did Mary say? Behold the handmaid of the Lord. What should you say? Behold the servant of God. Be it unto me according to thy word. I have more people write me, young people, and tell me I can't believe God will forgive me than all the people. You didn't hear me, let me say it again. More young people write me telling me I can't accept God's forgiveness. How could he forgive this or that than all the people? Do you know why you should believe and accept God's forgiveness? Because he said so. The woman who washed his feet with her tears and dried them with the hairs of her head, what did he say? Thy sins are forgiven. He created the world by his word. He forgives by his word. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. I mean, he's reliable and is legally appropriate. To forgive us our sins, finish the verse, and to cleanse. How many? Oh. If you believe that, can I see your hand? If you really believe it, stand up. Question for you, don't answer me. Is there an impossibility in your life? Makes no difference to me what your age is. Is there an impossibility in your life? Be it unto me. Finish the words. This is the power. One more quotation, I'll let you go. Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. If studied... And, can you guess the next word? Obey. The word of God works in the heart. Subduing. Give me another word for subdue. Control. Every unholy attribute. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart. Subduing. Every unholy attribute. Because there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Whatever you're struggling with, someone has struggled and is quite possibly struggling with. There's no challenge to God's word that's new to the word. The question is, will you and I make a decision to live our lives how? Come on. According to thy word. Will you say with me, Father, help me day by day moment by moment, to live my life according to thy word. May I see your hand now. Hands down, heads bowed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your ability to make the impossible possible. You spoke through Christ, and the universe appeared. You spoke, living things appeared. Father, when Christ comes the second time, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, he will speak. All the dead in Christ from Abel will rise. He spoke and the wind obeyed. He spoke and the sea obeyed. He spoke and the ravens obeyed and fed Elijah. His word is power. Father, Help us to cease insulting you by not believing the power of your word. Ah, God, tonight, tonight, as we stand in your presence, let us believe your word. As Mary said, behold the handmaid of the Lord, let us say, I am your servant, dear God. As Abraham believed in the Lord, despite the impossibility in Abraham's mind. Let us believe what God said to Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, when he asked him, is anything too hard for the Lord? Of course, dear Father, the answer is no. Let us live by saying nothing's too hard for God, nothing's too hard for God. Let's say that as we obey the powerful word. Now as we leave, we're in the holy hours, dear God. Let us not allow idle conversation to snatch this message from our minds. Let us think and reflect and make personal application. Watch over us tonight. Let the mighty angels take us to our homes and bring us safely back. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, 
Amen and amen. You may be seated. It is now time for our closing hymn. Can you all re return to standing? And it will be open your hymnals to hymn number 320, Lord of Creation. Hymn number 320. will you take from the message tonight? Raise your hand and tell me. Yes, sister. Be it unto me, according to thy word, how often? All the time. Someone else, yes, sister. Stop staring at the problem. Look at God. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be saved from that problem. Somebody else, raise a hand and tell us. Yes, my dear brother. Nothing is impossible with God, Luke 137, Luke 1827. Yes. Say it again. Let God's word, that's how God purifies by the word. John 15:3. Now you're clean through the word. Somebody else. Yes. Say it again. Right, you cannot say you're worshiping the Almighty God and are still intimidated by all these impossibilities in your life. It makes God look bad. It really does. Yes. Huh? Yes, yes, my handsome young brother. Behold the man servant of the Lord. How many other young men can say that? Can I see your hand? Behold the man servant of the Lord. Come on, raise your hands. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Some people need help. Yes. Say it again. Uh-huh. I can do all things. How? And Christ is the word. Yes. Somebody else. What will you take? Yes. Say that again. The Father who made you, the Creator who made you, can keep you. Not only can He keep you, He wants to keep you. Yes. Ah, yes. Yes. He did it for Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, you name it. Nebuchadnezzar was saved. He can do it for me. Paul was a murderer. Christ saved him. He did it for them. He can do it for me. Why? Because I am the Lord. I change not. Somebody, yes, my brother. God may call us to give up rights, but not principles. Yes, give up rights, not principles. Not principles. You came to the intersection first. It's a four-way stop. Someone is pulling out, you rush ahead, accident, because you had a right. Mm -mm. The, the, one that create, create the one who created you will sustain you. What did Jesus say? The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Yes, somebody else. What will you take? Yes, we're in the back. Only divine power can conquer sin. Yes. Absolutely. Christ was born in Mary. He can be born in us spiritually. Absolutely. By the way, Christ was called that holy thing. He was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mary. John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mary. Jeremiah was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb of uh, his mother, whatever her name was. Yes. Jesus has the right and the power, yes, to forgive. How many sins? Big and small. Mm hmm. Anything else? Yes. I like what you said. If you believe and follow, give me a smaller word for follow. Obey, you will grasp. John 7, 17, 
If any man will do his will, obey, he shall know the doctrine. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, what will you take? Better to obey than sacrifice. Yeah, obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, 22, 23. Did I see a hand in the back? Yes, my sister. Direct my steps in thy word. Order my steps in thy word. Yes, Psalm 119, verse 133. Let me do it, says God. Get out of the way and let me do it. One more. Oh, I saw two more. Okay. <laughs> yes, sister. Uh, hmm? Total surrender. You see, if you surrender 99%, who controls the 1%? Satan. And that doesn't work. Mm -mm. Because God gave Christ, how? 100%. I saw a hand over there. The brother from Malawi. Let, let no sin have addiction over me. Yes. By God's that's right. That's right. Psalm 119, 133. Psalm 19, verse 13. Let's pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let me give you this quotation. Our high calling, page 116, paragraph 2. Your last thought at night, your first thought in the morning, should be of Him in whom is centered your hope of eternal life. Go to sleep thinking about Jesus. Protect your mind from Satan. Wake up in the morning thinking about Christ. God bless you.